We have a guest on the show today. His name is Stuart Armstrong, and he works at the Future of Humanity Institute that we've mentioned several times over the course of the Teot Wauki specials, who are looking at big picture existential risks. Stuart Armstrong's research at the Future of Humanity Institute centres on the safety and possibilities for artificial intelligence, AI, how to define the potential goals of AI, and to map humanity's partially defined values onto it, and the long-term potential for intelligent life across the reachable universe. He has been working with people at the FHI and other organisations such as Google's DeepMind to formalise the things that we desire to have in our AI in general models, so that AI designers can include these safety methods in their designs. So Stuart, thanks for coming on the show. Um, first I wanted to ask about your academic background. What did you study for your PhD, your DPhil, and how did you get involved in the Future of Humanity Institute? Um, I studied uh, mathematics, in fact, and uh, I wish I could say that it's directly related to what I'm doing now, but um, it actually isn't. Um, it was in a differ a differential geometry. And I got involved in the Future of Humanity Institute when I worked just next door on uh, computational biochemistry, and they seduced me in with cool-sounding problems and then they made me fa uh, care about the um, uh, fate of the world and all that, which is very bastardly. <laughs> uh, so then I uh, joined them. And that makes a lot of sense because it was probably founded. I mean, all of this work really started with, uh, well, it didn't start, but it began to take on a, a new life with Nick Bostrom, who started publishing philosophical papers a few decades ago about um, existential risks and the end of the world and so on. And uh, Alongside oh, the, the, the end of humanity. The that's... end of humanity. Yes, that's yes. It's an important distinction because he talks about there being lots of different categories of risks, um, lots of different types of existential risk, including things like suffering risks and end of humanity risks and things that lead to what what's called a dismal realization of uh, civilization, I suppose, where we manage to reach technological maturity but in a way that's so flawed, it's uh, it's not a good prospect for humans. So I'd just like to ask you, how do you, as you work in the field, how do you view the field of existential risk studies as a discipline? Um, it's very eclectic um, because the different risks are very varied. Um, just to give an example, you have risks like... Uh, asteroid impacts where we have actually pretty we have very good understanding of that we've scanned the skies we know where most of the asteroids are and how they're moving so we've actually got really good figures uh, there it turns out there's less risk um than we thought so there all you what you can do in that area is say we know this is the risk um these are some of the ways we can reduce it or prevent it uh these are ways we can scan it this is where you can send the money. So that's sort of uh, pretty straightforward. And then at the other end, you have uh, things like biotech risks, AI risks, and the um, a wonderful category of unknown risks, where um, we really have poor models. Well, not just us, nobody has good models of what's going to happen. And there it's more about dealing with uncertainty so there's a variety of different approaches uh, across the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And this is, a, this is something that I think I've found, because what I'm doing in the show at the moment is I'm going through, in an unfortunately slightly clickbaity way, the top 10 list of potential apocalypses. And in some way, I found trying to rank these disparate threats as quite a difficult exercise, because on the one hand, you have things like asteroid strikes which could be potentially devastating but that we can predict and are low probability on the other hand you've got things that are happening now and ongoing such as climate change which you know is occurring definitely and will lead to some bad consequences but might not necessarily wipe out the species depending on how things go hmm. climate change is unlikely to uh, wipe out the species yes absolutely i mean you would need to have a very very um extreme version where you end up with i don't know a runaway greenhouse of the oceans or something to conceivably kill the whole human race and then there are these threats like ai which which you're working in principally at the moment for fhi um and this is something that i think 
what you were talking about reminded me of the Donald Rumsfeld quote about known knowns and unknown unknowns and all that kind of thing. With a super intelligent AI, which is, I think, the biggest concern, um, we it's an unknown unknown in the sense that we don't necessarily know how such a thing will behave. Um, so I understand that you do work principally in AI, but what else would you say keeps you up at night in terms of existential risks? <laughs> um, none of them, actually. Um, humans are... Well, we're very flawed in that our emotional uh, response is not um, comparable with the um, with the intensity of uh, the risk. So um, I'm kept up at uh, night by minor political things <laughs> and um, not by uh, these extreme uh, risks, which is, in a sense, lucky, because um, if I had the correct emotional response to risks like this, I uh, uh, wouldn't be able to get out of bed. But in a, in a very real sense, there is, I think, maybe a difficulty in understanding the appropriate emotional response, because... It, it's this question of if something is low probability but very devastating, how do you assess this versus something that is high probability but less devastating? It's it's a little tricky to quantify. And I think as humans, there's an essay that was in uh, Bostrom and Sirkovic's book, the Global Catastrophic Risks book, about um, the millennial, the millennialism in response to existential risks, which is this idea that humans have a tendency to shape them into narratives that we have that are quite preconceived where because we have these inbuilt cultural narratives about the end of the world that we want to shape things into we might not be assessing it in the most rational way mm -hmm. definitely um it's uh it sort of offends human intellect the idea that we could have an end to the world and that it would be uh by accident or uh, that it doesn't map onto any of the big moral uh, or political battles that people are used to. There's a term, I believe, that they call people looking at the future in near mode and far mode. Okay. So near mode is where you basically look at the practicalities, and far mode is where you do these sort of grand narratives. And certain things seem to trigger far mode thinking. And definitely things like apocalypses and things of that nature very strongly trigger uh, far mode thinking. And so there is a consequence to this far mode thinking to the emotional response, because um, I remember there was a great analogy in that same book that was talking about how you can talk to people who would never harm a child or another person, but mm -hmm. they will talk blithely about the extinction of all of humanity because, mm -hmm. in a sense, we're just not calibrated to deal with that. Do you think that the only way to deal with this is from an academic standpoint, trying to be as rational as possible about the risks, almost like an insurer for the species? Or do you think that there's a, a less, I don't know, an advantage to hysteria or not? <laughs> um, there's not an advantage to hysteria. Um, the times, The time to think emotionally or with the gut reasoning is in situations where you have a certain experience and a certain repeatability. So like uh, the sort of supreme example is firefighters who mm -hmm. have a knack for, once they have some experience for seeing the risk, seeing the right thing to do, the immediately correct uh, uh, solution springs immediately to their mind and so on. So there's a study of how uh, firefighters make decisions, and it's very far from the rational analysis, but it is very effective. But it is premised on having a lot of experience uh, of the situation before. Seeing as there's a relatively limited experience of apocalypses, <laughs> um, no one has the correctly calibrated feeling uh, for these things. So the various rational analysis tools are essential. Um, the sort of expected utility approaches, but while realizing that there's a lot of cases where you don't actually have decent probabilities, so you can't just plug in numbers. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about the expected utility approaches, I think this is perhaps moving into some of the realms of philosophy that existential risk studies go into where they try and define 
uh, principles for human actors. So there's things like the Maxi Pock rule. Would you like to talk about that? Um, yeah, the Maxi Pock rule is a sort of rule of thumb that instead of doing an expected utility calculation, you sort of say, well, this is an okay outcome, and we do the maximum we can. Uh, we need to ensure that that happens. Probably a lot more tractable than uh, expected utility calculations. So when we talk about an expected utility calculation, this is just the idea that, I don't know, we want to model the future of human civilization as a big equation and throw in all the parameters and say, these are the things we want to maximize and attempt to resolve it mathematically, in a sense. Yeah, but the, the uncertainties are so large that generally the models mainly serve to encode the either prejudices or opinions of the people who make them mm -hmm. at this level. Um, one of the big debates is whether, uh, say, 90% 90, 90 of the uh, human population becoming extinct, how bad is that compared with 100%? Mm -hmm. Because a 90% extinction, people can then rebuild from that. So that's we generally see that as actually um, not nearly as bad as a 100% uh, extinction scenario. So you can't uh, do sort of expected utility calculations with um, population numbers. The other thing is that there is, we're talking about the potential future of humanity, uh, which may include expansion across uh, the universe. In fact, probably will if humanity continues as a technological civilization. Um, but there are different measures to how great such futures could be and how to compare them. Um, and because the numbers are so large, the assumptions you make tend to dominate uh, in the calculation. That's where the Maxipoc rule, it, it basically simplifies away all those things. So you don't need to worry about whether future human civilization will be a billion times better than now or 10 trillion times better than now or whatever mm -hmm. numbers you put there, you just aim for. So the, the maxi poc implicitly has a sort of utility function that puts all good outcomes at about the same level. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, uh, all disasters at around zero and you could consider that it does uh, expected utility with this simplified uh, utility function. This, this is a bit of a simplification, but that's that's kind of true. Of course, I, I I see the distinction. I think it's it's about saying let's not attempt to compare the apples that we don't know with the oranges that we don't know of all potential future human civilizations. Let's just try and avoid things. Um, that are there, there's a quote by um, Philip K. Dick, I think that rem it reminds me of a little bit, where he says the object of life is not to find oneself on the side of majority, but to avoid finding oneself in the ranks of the insane. And so it's almost an effort just to avoid finding ourselves in the ranks of uh, defunct, terrible civilizations, I suppose. So on to artificial intelligence then. So for the listeners there's some confusion surrounding the types of artificial intelligence algorithms that currently exist so there's the ones that can play chess and serve you appropriate advertising and that's referred to as ai by a lot of people especially the people who are selling it and then there's the type of artificial intelligence that people might think of as an existential risk and i think if there's this distinction between a strong and weak ai it would be great to hear you talk about that and the ways that what we now see as AI might somehow in the future be linked towards a stronger AI? Um, well, first I need to repeat that there is huge uncertainty where AI is concerned. Um, we really don't know what is likely to be coming up in the next 10, 20 or 50 years. Um, and if you get polls of experts, they have a similar spread of uncertainty. Now, the uncertainty is not particularly reassuring because that means that AI might come a lot faster than we expect, just as it might come a lot slower than we expect. If you have anyone who comes on TV and says this is what will happen, most of the time what they're saying could happen 
but there's no particular reason to suspect that that'll happen more than any of the other thousands of possibilities. But I tend to focus on the worst case scenario just because that's where um, my research could do the most benefit, could have the most benefit. What's sort of been a bit of a surprise in the last, say, 20 years is that people before used to imagine that the general intelligence was where it's at, that um, if you had a machine that could uh, pass the Turing test or win on Jeopardy or drive a car, what you would have was basically a human-like intelligence in that it could think in many different areas and have um, and be competent in many different ways. However, that's turned out to not be the case. We've solved most of those problems, including arguably the Turing test, depending on how strict you want to interpret the rules, um, using narrow intelligences that we're using. So basically algorithms that we're using specific ideas, not general intelligences. You can see this by, say, the fact that Watson, the AI that won on Jeopardy, has proven to be, until very recently, incapable of doing anything useful except for winning on Jeopardy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But it's very highly optimized to the specific task. And I think this is the idea of a, of a weak artificial intelligence, as it's sometimes called. I don't want to uh, tread on anyone's toes with technical definitions, but an algorithm that's highly specialized or, or learns to be highly specialized at a very specific task. And in that sense, the artificial intelligence can exceed the capacities of humans at things like chess and Go and so on. But there, we haven't yet reached this sense of a strong AI that would be a, a general intelligence that's multi-purpose. But are you saying that there could still be existential consequences to weak AIs that are specialized towards specific tasks? Or is it just that there will be enough of them that when combined, their efforts are indistinguishable from that of a general intelligence. I prefer to call them narrow. Um, there are some risks from uh, narrow AIs, mainly the sort of bad actor risk um, if they're used by uh, objectionable humans for objectionable ends. Um, and there's also the possibility of um, uh, uh, the possibility, again, with the uh, I want to emphasize the uncertainties of, say, mass unemployment um, in many areas, depending on how automation progresses. Um, but those are sort of relatively low risk compared with. Yeah, you could have scenarios of existential risk from narrow AIs, but they're not really that plausible mm -hmm. um yeah you can always come up with anything but it's mainly from the general intelligences that the risk uh, happens where the ai has cross-domain capabilities where they're capable of making money more effectively while making political speeches while doing technological research or just some key mix of these abilities well there's a good book that's out at the moment which is max tegmark's book on ai and in the opening chapters he discusses this scenario where a startup develops an AI and they use it to corner the market in, you know, the entertainment industry and then politics. And it, it, it's this cross domain capability where it can absorb information and learn how to manipulate people and eventually society that sort of allows this sense of AI subtly taking over the world. So I guess mm -hmm. that's more of a cross domain capability problem. Yeah, there are many scenarios of that type, like um, you could say, uh, like, if an AI is particularly good at economic advice, you could become dependent on it for economic growth. There's various scenarios of hacking AIs, copying themselves on the Internet. Anyway, all to be realistic, <laughs> realistic in a in a very speculative domain. Yes. If there is a takeover risk from AI, it would almost certainly be an AI that would have to adapt to the human countermeasures, um, whatever they might be, and or predict and uh, avoid them. Therefore, it needs that level of general intelligence. And uh, what is most likely, though, is that this risk would come from an AI that would appear to be cooperative up until 
be a moment when it's too late because appearing to be cooperative is in the interest of any AI, um, no, uh, no matter what its goal. Yes, yes. And it's a good strategy to be um, a student of human psychology if you believe that humans still have the power to switch you off right until the moment where they do, in fact, uh, lose that power to switch you off. So just moving slightly in a less speculative realm, we've already talked about these um, Watson's AI beating human contestants at Jeopardy. And then there's these other landmark moments that show up in AI as well. Um, Deep Blue beating Gary Kasparov of chess and Google's AlphaGo proving that AI could beat humans at Go. Um, and there's been a very recent explosion of interest and developments. Um, and I think it would be interesting to talk about the kinds of methods that people are using in artificial intelligence currently and what's behind this recent explosion in the technology. Um, in a sense, the methods are relatively unexciting um, in that they've been around for many years. Who? When was the first... Perceptron designed 19, Perceptron algorithm date back to the 1950s. So you could say that this is a, this is a really ancient uh, idea in computing. They've been developed recently when, uh, when first of all, there's a huge amount of data that can be trained on. Second of all, we've got a lot more computer power than we used to. And last but not least, um, we have much better ways to regularize them. Mm -hmm. So could you sort of broadly out outline how the uh, perceptron mechanism works if they came up with it in the 1950s when Alan Turing and the early sort of AI conferences were around? Is it a mathematical structure? How does how does it um, manifest as intelligence? Um, it, every, well, everything's a mathematical structure yeah. or an algorithm here. They're kind of interchangeable. But what it is, it, it was an analogy with the... Um, with the human brain, that you would have neurons, as they're so-called, that were connected uh, with each other. And at a certain moment, uh, if enough signal arrived, then another, a signal would go out. So they take inputs, and if they had enough inputs, then the signal would go out, like neurons receive um, signals, and that, that can trigger them to... Um, uh, I'm forgetting the uh, proper terminology, but basically spark and send out uh, a, a signal themselves. So that was the analogy. And it was shown that with these things, you could solve essentially any computable problem. But that's not really very exciting because the, um, you can you can solve any computable problem in theory uh, using many, many different algorithms. Um, so it it went around for a while and people were excited and then it didn't show all that much promise. Uh, there's various AI winters. And now um, they've been dusted off and are working uh, much better. Uh, mainly, as I say, because we have much more powerful computers so we can write, we can run much deeper neural nets, deeper meaning more layers. So you have layer after layer, these neurons connected with each other. In it, uh, which allows you to do things of extremely high complexity and train it on a lot of data, run it fast. And in theory, that should work wonderfully. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, um, what happens is that this uh, tends to go to uh, overfitting. This is the idea that, I don't know, if you have a curve and you have uh, many data points scattered around, then ideally you want to identify an underlying trend and not just have a curve that joins up all the dots. Yes. Um, in, for example, the example of um, image recognition, if you have 10,000 photos of dogs and 10,000 photos of cats, you want you don't want the machine to basically memorize every single of the 10,000 photos. No, you want it to recognize what they have in common and then be able to draw analogies between different situations so that it so that it emulates so that it seems like it has conceptual understanding rather than just excellent recognition of the things that it's seen before. Uh, and there's a, a variety of different uh, techniques there, but the regularization was absolutely, was absolutely vital. Basically, what, if you regularize things properly, you can put very huge uh, neural nets and get the high capacity 
without overfitting. Okay, so it's it's a combination of developments, but in fact, it's mostly driven by you know the progress of Moore's law that has meant that computer processors can be smaller and more efficient and so on, and the massive amounts of data that we're collecting on things that has rather than any great theoretical advance. And the regularization. And the regularization is the main theoretical advance. There, there, there are others. I mean, I'm not a yes, okay, deep yeah. expert on the details. And apologies to anyone who thinks I've missed out something important. But my understanding is that those are the three key pieces. Of course. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a paradigm shift. It's not a fundamentally new underlying idea behind this recent explosion, so much as it is developments on a framework that existed for a long time there's a, there's a lot of internal paradigm shifts or improvements yeah are yeah absolutely. seeming coming out all over the place ah sorry i'm an academic i quibble <laughs> over everything uh, absolutely i mean it's very important to do so in this field because you know if we get it wrong <laughs> there's existential risks around the corner um so in previous episodes uh, of this show we've talked about this very popular idea of a, a technological singularity, which has been popularized by um, techno evangelists, I guess, like Ray Kurzweil and others. And it's this idea that exponential progress in technology, artificial intelligence, will result in an intelligence explosion where an AI learns how to optimize itself and eventually attains levels of super intelligence beyond what we can imagine, that sort of thing. And in his optimistic dream, this happens by a specific year, which is 2029. And in his optimistic dream, it's also harnessed by humans to create a, a techno utopia where the power of this super intelligence is used to uh, cure diseases, fix climate change, any other problems you might have, make ourselves immortal by uploading our brains to the cloud, that kind of thing. And and you can find people in the media predicting um, this singularity or, or a generalized AI in the next few decades and others who think it's much further away. And I really enjoyed reading one of your papers, which was a history, in a sense, of uh, historical predictions about artificial intelligence and just how difficult it's been to make accurate predictions about how the technology will develop. And you might not want to be in the prediction business yourself, but uh, hearing something about how these historical and current predictions have gone would be great, the, the trends in them and how we can tell a good prediction that people are making from shall we say, a less well-posed one? Um, okay. Uh, I mean, I, I dislike the term singularity. Yes. Uh, because it turns to um, push people into far mode thinking or into, yeah, uh, uh, into sort of rapture of the nerd versus techno-utopia, uh, that kind of uh, way of thinking. <laughs> Um, and it's, so on these four predictions, I mean, Kurzweil doesn't have a bad track record for um, near-term predictions. It's not nearly as good a track record as he claims, but it's <laughs> relatively impressive. Um, uh, but these are sort of near-term predictions and as you talk about this sort of super intelligence or especially singularity then the quality of predictions goes down um what i look for in high quality predictions is somebody that decomposes the predictions quite well this will be lead to this this will lead it to that or if we have this then we can have that um and who has wide uh, error bars Mm -hmm. So 2029, we have a singularity is a bad prediction because you're not predicting a mechanism by which it happens. You have a very narrow error bar um, for the sake of selling books, I suppose. And you also have a very narrow prediction. Well, you have a very ill-defined prediction because you're not predicting a specific phenomenon so much as a, a runaway explosion of intelligence. That uh, Yeah, no, I mean, mechanisms are too... Uh, you don't want to be over certain. Mm -hmm. Okay. This must happen and that must happen. A thing that if we get this, then we will get that. This is needed for that. And then therefore, and these are the approximate timelines we might get this. Then we might have AI is not a good prediction, but it's better than most predictions, which um, seem to be generally, I feel 
that this will happen in an area where, as I say, you don't have any real expertise. You have expertise in developing current AI prediction, uh, sorry, AI technologies, but no one has any expertise in the sort of extreme AIs, mm -hmm. the general intelligences, which do basically do not exist. So if someone is saying a conditional scenario, then they're probably giving a decent estimate for the probability of that scenario. Um, decent meaning not as hideously wrong as throwing darts. Um, and if we take it for that particular scenario, then that might be um, that might be reasonable. But we have to consider other scenarios. And in, in your paper specifically, there were two aspects of bias that you were looking to um, eliminate from predictions, as well as giving a, a broader overview of predictions that people have made throughout history about when a human level intelligence would be reached, when a Turing test would be passed, that kind of thing. And I guess two of the main um, pieces of folk belief, perhaps, about these predictions is the first one is that people always say that anything is 15 to 20 years away, whether it's in the mm -hmm. nuclear fusion business or the men on Mars business or the general artificial intelligence business. And the other one is this idea that people tend to predict uh, the advent of AI shortly before their own deaths so that they will live to experience it. So it's two quite easy to define uh, cognitive biases, I guess, that you'd expect humans to have when they're making predictions that are influenced by emotion rather than uh, the facts as far as we have them available. Uh, so could you talk about what you found in investigating those? We found some evidence for the first scenario, um, the 15 to 25 years away scenario, uh, but little evidence for the second that um, people predicted AI um, just before their own uh, demise. So um, the, the, it, there was a clustering definitely around 15 years ahead. Um, I could, I'm speculating that it's because it's hard to imagine that something is possible, but would take 40 years of innovations before we get there. It's hard to both believe that we're definitely getting there and that it would take 40 years of innovations, but sort of 15 years, you can see that growing out of today's technology. Mm -hmm. But the, it's not all, not everyone was predicting in that. It was about a third, as I recall. Yeah, so, and of course, mo a lot of those predictions have already been proven wrong because mm -hmm. the 15 to 25 years has already passed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I suppose another thing that comes into a human bias about predictions is I think there's probably the long tail of that is... Um, less reliable because in terms of thinking at least when i try to think about what 100 years of technological innovation might look like compared to 200 years compared to 500 years compared to a thousand years i can't make any meaningful distinctions in my mind about it um so i feel that people are unlikely to predict things um and say yes it will be precisely 4010 ad when we get these particular um general intelligences even if please 4011 <laughs> exactly Okay, so um, some of the particular scenarios, I know that we've talked about how uncertain everything is, um, but we see in the media all the time, and a lot of listeners will see this, Stephen Hawking, Elon Musk, whatever, warns that AI will destroy the species. And I think it would be interesting to get your perspective on some of the scenarios where AI does constitute an existential risk. What are they and how could we hope to avoid them? The scenarios where AI is are an existential risk are relatively simple to phrase. It's um, basically those where um, AI, the AI becomes powerful and takes over in practice the running of the world. Um, either it might be something as mild as the AI has much better long-term planning than humans, uh, and hence um, its decisions are taken with a 10,000-year uh, planning horizons, whereas ours are not. But it's basically a world that will be shaped by the goals that we have given AIs. Um, there are some arguments as to whether AIs would have goals, 
Um, but there seems to be at least reasonably strong arguments that they would uh, or are likely to. So, therefore, if the AIs determine the long-term trajectory of human society, then um, we become, in the end, what they what their goal says we should be. So basically, there's the the assumption, first assumption is AIs could become very powerful. The second one is that they would have goals, and the third one is that it would be unfriendly for human flourishing, um, given that it is very and this is it's very hard to specify um, good and moral outcomes in terms of. Um, so I think we this is the sort of area of value misalignment that people are worried about. And there's the extreme example that people quite often pose, which is the paperclip problem, which is the idea that if you instruct a super powerful, super intelligent AI to construct paperclips, it might happily, having been failed to be programmed with the value of human life, um, destroy humanity and continue manufacturing paperclips. That's a very extreme example to illustrate the point. But you could also imagine uh, a scenario that I thought about was if you're going to try and program morality into an artificial intelligence we don't have an agreement about what the moral thing the good thing to do is in all circumstances um coming up with that consensus is one thing and then programming it into an ai is quite another but one thing that people have often tried to talk about is utilitarianism as in take actions cause the maximum good to the maximum possible number of people and yet through a utilitarian argument for example, if there were nine people who needed organ transplants and one healthy person, you could maximize the sum of the happiness function or the sum of human lives by killing the healthy person and transplanting their organs into the nine unhealthy people. And, you know, this is the sort of decision that an algorithm might take, but a human would have moral qualms about. There's three points. First of all, the paperclip maximizer is not my favorite example here. Mm -hmm. I think it's much... Um, uh, it's it's much more suggestive to talk about the money maximizer, okay, which is really quite plausible. You have an AI CEO that is programmed to maximize money or shareholder value as measured by money, and that's um, their specified goal. They implement that, and that's I think something that we've already seen human intelligences yes. willing to do. So um, it's not. Uh, unreasonable to suggest uh, that AIs might be able to do it uh, just as well or, or better if they're of uh, higher intelligence. The other thing is the utilitarian aspect. The thing is, as agents get more and more powerful, they tend to become more utilitarian um, because... Like if you're just walking around yourself, um, you can get away with a don't kill people, don't steal stuff kind mm -hmm. of principle. If you're trying to run a health system or a police force or a country uh, or a country, you basically have to um, think in a far more utilitarian way because any decision about, say, you want to ban some product that may cause cancer or other things mm -hmm. if you don't then there's a risk that there people will use it get cancer and die if you do and it's of low risk or uh, uh and very valuable then things get more expensive uh your economy suffers and um, you don't have as much money to do health care or other things with it, and people get sick and die. So um, without you ever going out to uh, kill someone and steal their organs, you, ha you are in effect doing decisions of that nature at that level just because of how powerful and large scale the decisions are. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the final thing is that the organ transplant thing uh, is a terrible idea, <laughs> um, and that can basically be um, seen by thinking what would happen in a world where you 
where, say, hospitals regularly killed healthy people to steal their organs. Well, for a start, no one would ever go uh, near a hospital. Mm -hmm. People would live in fear of the doctors swooping in. And basically, the um, the scenario is is terrible. It is not a way of increasing uh, utility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the 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 idea of expected utility maximization is not increase utility with the first naive idea that you can think of, uh, but actually look through the whole thing. If you have an AI that's acting to maximize a particular utility function, if -hmm. that function is ill-defined, then it could end up making decisions that we would consider terrible. But um, oh yes, and I think that's got to be the biggest concern, right? That some some algorithm attains power and does things in a way that we haven't perhaps even haven't anticipated, that does serve to maximize uh, human happiness or whatever goal you program into it, but in a way that we don't like or agree with. That is the the big risk because it's very hard to define these things properly and safely, and they often have edge cases. Um, it's sort of like exams exams in school, say. Mm-hmm. What you want to do is increase the quality of students' uh, education, but the students' education is very hard to measure, uh, and we don't know how to do that. So instead, we mandate that students' test scores must go up. And as long as we put a mild pressure on that, that's fine. Uh, student test scores go up and education quality goes up. But if we make test scores the only measure of educational quality and push that massively, then everything goes into teaching to the test and maximizing the test at whatever cost. Mm-hmm. And you lose a lot of, uh, of actual education uh, value in there uh, because your measure which you specified is not what you wanted. Mm-hmm. It's it was a alignment with your goal, yeah. But uh, when you push it too far, it isn't. And I that's see. the sort of r- uh, risk that you get with all these goals. Like um, if human happiness is defined by certain chemicals in the brain, then we wouldn't want to end up as just sort of brainless bliss with co- uh, constant chemicals in our brain and no interaction with any hu- uh, anybody uh, or anything at all. Yes, exactly. And I think on on a personal level, if you ask people to define precisely what it is they want and they were able to get it, I think in a lot of cases, people would find that that's not what they wanted at all. So yes. you know, if, if we can't define even individually our own personal utility functions to maximize as a society, um, it will be even harder to one, do that, to program it into an artificial intelligence mm-hmm. and three, obtain widespread agreement that the utility function um, that we've chosen is the correct one. But of course, in the case of uh, an accelerating general intelligence or one that can accrue more and more power, um, the, the human debate probably doesn't enter into it because it will maximize the function that you've given it and you know might resist attempts to change that. Yes, though I have some methods to not make it resist mm-hmm. the attempts to change it. And other there are other ideas of how you can incorporate human preferences into the the process as it grows in it's a bit tricky to do but um yeah anyway there's no need to get technical it's you can have i mean you could conceive of a very powerful person that say listened to people's opinions and adjusted their trajectory uh their behavior based on that therefore it's conceivable to have an ai that does the same thing uh, no matter how powerful they become the problem is that you don't have the other constraints on human behavior that you might have with an actual human so it's now dependent on its motivation and not on any other aspect a benevolent ai dictator is possible but difficult to program i suppose um i prefer a benevolent ai non-dictator okay that would be nicer for us I but suppose. programming a non-dictator is harder than programming a dictator an ai that is developed will follow a similar but much broader role than the ones we've developed at the moment which is they have some function and they work to maximize that by exploring mathematically the parameter space of their models of what they know to be true and that sort of thing and 
So we're imagining that this AI, in some sense, maximizes a utility that we give it. And we've talked about the difficulty of defining that utility. So in terms of AI safety, there must be other things that people are trying to both build into the systems that exist at the moment and kind of lay the framework for systems that might exist in the future. Things like, I don't know, the big red button that turns it off. What kind of thing are uh, people like you and people at the FHI working on in that regard? Well, I actually have a big red button design, as it turns <laughs> up, Chris, and, uh, which is ways of making AIs uh, unresistant to various ways of turning them off. And there are I also have some low low impact designs where an AI is uh, motivated to do something positive, but not do too much, not be too transformative, uh, which is another way of restricting its uh, its its effect. There are ideas of sort of decomposing AI abilities into pieces, which are safer. Um, and there's Oracle AI's ideas, which are using AI's as question answers. Um, so you never give it, it any actual power. It's, it's a purely consultative system. Yeah, though consultants can be extraordinarily powerful. Yes. Um, so this is getting an AI that might be safe to use as an Oracle is actually quite a delicate job, but I think I can see, uh, ways of doing it. So um, do you think that the current approach to AI with uh, with neural networks and improved processing power can produce something that we'd consider intelligent that would manifest itself out of the complexity of the network, as some people like to say? Or do we need a better understanding and mimicry of the biological brain? Or is there some other technique that might be necessary, do you think, to make a stronger AI? I don't know. Um <laughs> If we get AI soon, I expect it'll be something neural net based. If it's further out into the future, then it's, um, it's very hard to say. Mm -hmm. Because I think it's just strange to me, this idea that you'd make a very complex neural net and it would suddenly develop a, a general human level intelligence. There's, there's a magic leap in the thinking there. And at least the idea that you could simulate a human brain, um, Obviously, there's huge technical barriers to be surmounted before you could do that. But it somehow seems like a more detailed story of how we'd come by this very intelligent AI. Well, neural nets are not functionally that different from brains. Um, that was the original inspiration for them. Mm -hmm. People are working on transfer learning, which is to get neural nets to have capability of learning from one problem and applying it to another. So that's at least a conceivable route. So, uh, Stuart, thank you very much for coming on the show. Uh, thanks, sir. So that's the end of the interview. If you're interested in Stuart's work, and given that he's designing that big red button to turn off the AI, and has thought as hard as anybody about the potentials and pitfalls of AI, I strongly suggest that you should be interested in his work. There are plenty of things you can do, though. You can visit the webpage to read his academic work with the Future of Humanity Institute by going to www.fhi.ox.ac.uk slash team slash Stuart dash Armstrong, although if you just Google Stuart Armstrong FHI, he shows up. There are some great papers on there, and not just about artificial intelligence. There was one that we didn't quite have time to discuss, but that I think is really fascinating. So long-time listeners to the show will know that we had an episode on the Fermi Paradox. In other words, this is the question that, if alien civilizations are so common, or should be so common, how can we explain the fact that none of them have communicated with us? So you'll remember from our episode, Fermi and Drake, that the solutions are kind of divided into two categories. Some of them say that civilizations are rare, because habitable planets are rare, or because life evolving is unlikely, or because life becoming intelligent is unlikely, or because civilizations destroy themselves, or are destroyed, in a narrow time window, and so syncing up with them in both time and space is not very likely. You should listen back to Fermi and Drake if you haven't already, because I'm really proud of what we did there. But Stuart has a paper with a novel kind of solution to this problem, which suggests that there could be very advanced civilizations, but they aren't talking to us. Why wouldn't they be talking to us? Well, Stuart suggests that they could be dormant, in hibernation, sleeping. But if that's the case, what are they waiting for? Well, Stuart suggests that this isn't really a hibernation, but an aestivation. That means that they're waiting for the universe to expand and get colder. Hibernation is when you sleep through the winter. This is when you sleep through the summer. A civilization might be motivated to do this because as the universe gets colder, 
computational efficiency increases. You know that information processing produces waste heat and entropy. Generally, you need to produce energy to pump that waste heat away. The warmer the surroundings are, the greater the amount of energy that you need to use. So humans are in fact already exploiting this? The main Facebook data centre for Europe is up in Luli, which is a city in Lapland in northern Sweden. So why do they put it there? Well, the simple answer is that the machines already produce so much heat that it's already far more efficient to have them in cold climes on Earth. So perhaps a technologically advanced alien civilization, or one that's been replaced by AI, is patiently waiting a few billion years for the universe to get cold enough to do their calculations cheaply and properly without using too much energy. If you actually go through the numbers which Stuart does, you find out that computers in the future could be a million trillion trillion times more efficient, 10 to the 30 times more efficient than the computers of today. Because every time you do a calculation, you're dissipating a tiny bit of energy. These future advanced civilizations would understand that the number of calculations you can do is finite. And Stuart points out that we don't know about the kind of motivations that civilizations other than humanity would have, particularly not these incredibly advanced civilizations that will probably have moved far beyond our petty human concerns. But presumably they will put more value on being able to do more calculations. Maybe they just want to figure out a way to avoid the heat death of the universe. Or maybe they want to live as long as possible. So let's make this concrete. Let's say that we humans are the ones that become technologically advanced and we somehow preserve our own consciousnesses and mentalities. And we realise that we can perform this kind of hibernation for billions of years. Let's say that in the future, for example, our brains are uploaded into computers so that we can be effectively immortal. But what is immortality? Immortality has a limit if there's a limit to the number of calculations you can do, right? Even if you're on a computer, you know, eventually the computer will stop working because the universe will be too dissipate and too dense and there won't be enough energy to feed the computer. So immortality could mean billions and billions of years. It could mean even longer than the universe itself will exist. But it wouldn't necessarily be forever. But we know that if you're simulating your life, for example, the amount of time you experience depends on the number of calculations you can perform. If you have a computer that can simulate the human brain perfectly, but can run a billion times faster than the human brain, then perhaps you could experience a billion years in just one calendar year, or however long it takes to do the appropriate calculations. If calculations are many times more efficient in the future, maybe it makes logical sense to be dormant until colder times, where calculations are more efficient, so you can extend your life in this way. You presumably only have a certain amount of energy, maybe you only have a certain amount of matter or mass that you can convert into energy, to turn into these computations. So even the most advanced technology would want to exploit this, these fundamental physical limits. It's not a question about our technology producing heat and being inefficient. It's actually, amazingly, a physical question that, literally, the storage and transfer of energy has a certain minimum amount of energy that it will always produce. So you can't create information, you can't generate information, you can't irreversibly turn a switch to change information, to rewrite information, without producing the small amount of energy. And whatever their goals are, it seems likely then that a futuristic civilization might choose to wait for cosmological changes in the universe, the universe to cool down enough that they can make good use of the energy that they have to perform as much computation as possible. So this is a wild idea, and as I say, you can read all about it in all its philosophical and mathematical detail on the Future of Humanity Institute website. If academic papers aren't your thing, he's also written a book called Smarter Than Us, The Rise of Machine Intelligence. You can get that on Amazon for just a few pounds, as it's an introductory book and it's quite short, and that's highly recommended. And he also suggested that those who want to read deep into the material should look for Nick Bostrom's book, Superintelligence, and keep an eye out on all the latest papers coming out of the Future of Humanity Institute. Okay, as you can tell, my voice is about to give away, so I will leave it there and I will talk to you again next week. But in the meantime, there's plenty of things you can do for us as well. You can go to physicspodcast.com, you can leave us reviews and ratings on the comments there, Leave us a review and rating on iTunes, that helps get the word out. And you can help get the word out by flyering for the show. You can tell all of your friends to listen to it. You can play it on speaker systems in public transport so that the whole world's hooked. Because the more people listen, the closer we come to world domination. And when we get there, we can all live forever in computerised brains. Perhaps. I'll see you next time.